Hey everyone, I don't know why I haven't promoted this as much as I probably should, but if you're interested in just the audio for each video, you want to save your battery life for having your phone on YouTube all night, or you just want to be able to turn it on, lock your phone, forget about it, you can listen to the audio for every video that I have over on Spotify. Just search up The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis, you'll see this, you can click on it, and every single video for about the past year and a half, and new videos when they come out, will be available on Spotify, and they're all free to listen to. It really, really helps out the channel when you listen over on Spotify, because of course, I get money from the plays just like I would on YouTube, but it's easier for some people if it's just audio. So if that's something you're interested in, there are links in the top of the description you can go to to listen there, and I would really, really greatly appreciate it. And I think you all will too. So thank you all for the continued support, and let's get right into tonight's stories. Last January, I was fired from my job due to the pandemic. I couldn't pay my rent, but evictions were frozen. So I basically sat at home stressed and terrified that my unseen landlord would find some other way to drive me out into the street. I felt like my fears were coming true when he showed up unexpectedly one evening, but I opened the door to find a smiling, stooped-over old man wearing a disposable blue mask and baggy clothes that hung from his skeletal frame. Thought I'd go around meeting my tenants since we're all tied together for the time being. He told me, his voice quavering from age. You can call me Mr. Durham. It's nice to meet you. I lied, hiding my stress. Sorry about not paying rent this month. Everything's shutting down, you know, and I lost my job and he waved away my excuses. None of that, no worries. I'm an old bag of bones. <laughs> what would I do with money? He looked up, locking eyes with me, and took several seconds to lift his cheeks for a wide smile that I couldn't see behind his mask. I'll waive your debt. All I ask is that you donate to a blood drive this month. Give back. I couldn't believe his generosity. Really? That's so incredibly kind of you. He waved away my thanks the same as he'd shrugged off my excuses. It's fine, no worries. He slowly gripped my wrist and squeezed it for a long moment. Do you need me to send you some nice home-cooked meals? Gotta keep your strength up in these trying times. Surprised by his physical contact, but always chronically incapable of accepting gifts, I shook my head. All right. Thanks, though. He removed his hand, but soon brought it back with a little red card. Here's the blood drive's address. Oh. Taken aback, I gazed down at the card in my hand. You, uh, had a specific one in mind. He winked. Gotta make sure you actually do it. With that, he turned and hobbled away at a snail's pace, leaving me to feel subtly violated in an odd way I couldn't quite put into words. Well, what choice did I have? If I could avoid being homeless by donating blood, well, <laughs> I had to do it. The next day I went to the address on the card. It was only a few blocks away, but the walk took me in an unfamiliar direction, past heavily trafficked roads thick with car exhaust and down labyrinth side streets full of shuttered businesses. The directions on my phone told me to turn into a dead-end alley, but I stood there at the mouth for a couple of minutes, struggling with my trepidation. I could see the steel entranceway from here, and a small red sign. Why was a blood drive through a barely marked door at the end of an alley in a semi-abandoned part of town? Nobody else went in or out as I waited, but the afternoon was wearing on and I told myself to get it done before the sunset. I didn't want to walk home in the dark. After texting my friend my location in a semi-joking manner, I headed down the narrow, clean alley and grabbed the door handle. Within was a white waiting room. The chairs, the walls, the floor, all spotless ivory. A nurse with pale skin to match sat at a white desk reading a book. 
I didn't see anything but her eyes behind her mask, and she ignored me until I walked up and said, Uh, hi? I'm here to give blood? She glanced over from her book, looking first at my hands and then around my upper body as if expecting me to be holding something. Confused, I asked. For Mr. Durham? Ah, she turned in her chair, grabbed some forms, and then handed them to me. Fill these out. Not unexpected, I supposed. I sat in a chair and filled out the forms with a red pen, on edge because of how oddly silent the place was. I didn't hear anything beyond the waiting room, and I still saw nobody else entering or leaving. I was definitely feeling nervous, but I thought it through. Why would anyone here hurt me? If I didn't return from this place, the authorities would immediately connect my disappearance to Mr. Durham because of the text I'd sent to my friend. On top of that, the nurse behind the desk was genuinely bored. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. If she was part of some sort of organ thieving or human trafficking ring, she would be on edge just like me. Instead, she just sat. Reading. I leaned to look. Oh. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. She saw me looking and narrowed her eyes. My cheeks burned. Right. Not a human trafficker. Taking a deep breath, I stood up and returned my forms. Follow me, she said, leading me back through a set of pearl doors into a sterile hallway. I glanced back at the front desk, about to ask her whether it was okay for her to leave it unattended, but it didn't seem like anyone was coming regardless. I followed her into a standard medical room and sat on the chair within. She had me make a fist and tense my arm. She clenched a particular spot and then brought a very large needle toward me that was connected by a tube to a hanging bag. It was only as I felt that familiar enervation from having my blood drawn that a thought occurred to me. I hadn't asked for proof that Mr. Durham was actually my landlord. He could have honestly been anybody, walking up to apartment doors in search of suckers on behalf of... <sighs> I lifted my head suddenly, fighting an overwhelming, draining feeling. Take it easy the nurse told me. You passed out. She removed the needle and I blinked groggily. Am I done? Yep, all done. See you next month. <laughs> oh, I'm not coming back. I stopped halfway through my sentence. I'd assumed this was a one-time thing, but if it was in lieu of rent, it would have to be monthly, wouldn't it? She led me back to the front, and I stumbled into evening twilight, feeling light and shaky. <sighs> well, they hadn't killed me or stolen a kidney, right? I touched my abdomen. No surgery scars, thank God. Later that night, I sat around talking it over with a group video call with my friends. Feeling tipsy after a single beer, I explained what had happened in a dramatic fashion. The guys didn't seem to fully understand. One asked, So this Durham guy waived your rent, then asked you to donate blood as some sort of paying it forward thing? I, I, I don't know, I told them. It was at this super shady and out of the way place. I was really scared. Another said, Yeah, giving blood can be pretty scary sometimes. Did you pass out? I did, but... I tried to explain why it had all felt so weird, but I supposed it was impossible to convey without having been there. They lightly teased me for fainting, and then the topic moved on. For the next couple of weeks, I moved on too. Until rent time rolled around again. Without anything better to do, I just sat in my bedroom waiting to see what would happen. Inevitably, a knock came on my door on the second evening after rent had been due. I answered it to find Mr. Durham standing there. He wasn't quite so stooped over and his voice was a little stronger. His eyes were intent above his mask. The blood drive's expecting you. Oh, right, I said wearily. Uh, instead of the rinse again? He nodded. That's the deal. Oh, 
I'll go tomorrow. See that you do. Feeling odd all over again, I closed the door softly as he walked away. What had initially seemed like an act of charity and community now made me feel uncomfortable. Worse, I was starting to run low on savings, so I didn't really have a choice. The next day, we went earlier in the afternoon than before. The same nurse was there, but her eyes still hidden behind her mask. This time, she was reading a clockwork orange. I didn't have to fill out forms, but I still had to wait for some reason until I realized that she was just finishing her current page. She closed the book, stood, and said, Follow me. I lifted my head suddenly, fighting an overwhelming, draining feeling. Take it easy, she told me. You passed out again. I rose from the chair a bit early, almost accidentally pulling at the needle that was still in my arm. I was in the back room, though I couldn't quite remember walking in there. She put a small bandage on my arm and then let me stumble out. I felt very groggy and it was nearly sunset. I was confused about the time, but I made my way home, fighting the urge to pass out again. Once I got there, I crashed in bed and only woke up the next day. Over a group video call, it was my friends that told me, Aren't you supposed to wait two months in between blood donations? Maybe that's why you're so tired. I looked it up, and they were right. As my savings neared empty, I paced my apartment, not sure what to do. Over the next couple of weeks, I started eating less to save money, so my strength returned slowly. The inactivity sure wasn't helping. I busied myself with games and television, trying not to think about it. The evening after rent was due again, Mr. Durham knocked on my door. He was as old as ever, but didn't seem so frail anymore. He told me simply, The blood drive's expecting you. I'm too weak, I told him. It, it's too soon. I'll have meals delivered, he countered. Nice, full, hearty meals on me. We'll keep your strength up. I frowned openly at him for the first time. I'll find a way to pay you money. Like I said, I don't want your money. His eyes were quite serious above his masked and unseen expression. I want you to donate blood. Then I'll do it at another place. No, it has to be that one. I shook my head. Why? Why do you want me to donate blood at that specific place? I don't owe you an explanation, he said, his tone final. Do it or face the consequences. He strode away and I glared after him. He put on the manner of a nice old man at the start, but now he felt vaguely menacing. But what choice did I have? I lifted my head suddenly, fighting an overwhelming, draining feeling. Take it easy, the nurse told me. You passed out again. I jumped up from the chair, pulling painfully the needle as it was still in my arm. She gripped me hard by the wrist and gently pulled it out before applying a small bandage to seal the wound. I stumbled out in the evening twilight, wondering when I'd even left my apartment. Everything was blurring together and I was feeling beset by a blanket of exhaustion and mental fog. When I awoke two days later, I stared at the morning sunlight on my wall for a full twenty minutes, facing the reality of my situation. It was time to consider what I now deemed both obvious and impossible. My landlord was a fucking vampire. Looking up what information I could, I tracked down his residence and started following him during the day. Through his windows, I could see Durham puttering around in his unassuming little house, and I watched from afar with a cheap pair of binoculars. He didn't burst into flames in sunlight, and he didn't seem to be an overt creature of the night, but I couldn't think of no better explanation for him taking my rent in blood, which I could now objectively see was an insane proposition. On my regular group video call with my friends, I told them, This guy? 
this. One little old man owns like 500 properties all over the city. Some of them have been in his family for over 100 years. My friends seemed uncomfortable. One asked, So you're stalking your landlord? I'm just looking into him, I shot back. Why aren't you guys on my side here? He's literally taking my blood. Well, he's not taking it, you're giving it, another said. And you don't have to pay rent. That's awesome. I'd kill not to have pay rent. Oh, man, I could save up so much money without that expense. I might even afford a deposit on a house. They all agreed wholeheartedly, with the fantasy of not paying rent, but I angrily shouted, I'm not saving any money! I don't even have a job! And then I hung up the video call. I'd gone too far. Nobody called me back. As the days passed, all I could do was eat the meals Durham sent over and weekly pace my apartment. The night before paying rent, I decided I wasn't going to do it. I'd rather be on the street. I lift my head suddenly, fighting an overwhelming, draining feeling. Take it easy, the nurse told me. He passed out again. I stared at her. What the fuck? She blinked. Rude? Pulling the needle out myself and forgoing a bandage, I staggered down the hall into the evening twilight. It was all I could do to make it home and pass out in bed, awaking in the blink of an eye to the afternoon sunlight. What day was it? I'd paid rent two days before. I got up, found the pile of delivered meals, and hungrily wolfed them all down, ignoring how long some of them had been sitting out. I passed out again, this time from a food coma, and awoke in a mess of wrappers in the middle of the night. My life was becoming a blur. Too weak to do anything else, I lay around watching television for an indeterminate amount of time. I just watched one series while I recovered, I decided, and then I... I lifted my head suddenly, finding an overwhelming, draining feeling. I tumbled forward, interrupting the nurse's palpitude. I grabbed the wall and lurched this way and that, fighting my way out of the donation center despite nobody trying to stop me. I slept right in the alley all night long, and nobody woke me. In the morning, I rose like a zombie and shuffled my way home. Where was all my time going? I could see my browser and location history on my phone. I'd been alive and awake and doing things since this had begun, but it was all a haze in my mind. It was even a month later than I thought it was. I'd lost track of how many donations I'd given. I literally couldn't remember one of the times I'd been there. I had fantasies of grabbing a wooden stake and sneaking into Durham's place to put an end to this the movie way. But the lag time on my motivation meant every time I sent my mind to doing something, another month would pass before I even tried. Eventually, I found myself staring at a gaunt husk of a man gazing back at me from beyond a coffee shop window. It was me. I was a husk. I'd lost touch with all my friends, I'd left all my plans by the wayside, and I barely had enough energy to survive each day. I didn't even have the energy to cry. I just asked strangers on the street for change, a laborious process which took hours and drained all I had left. They were quite giving once they really noticed me and saw how sick and listless I was, but it took a lot of convincing to get anyone to actually look at me. I bought a bus ticket and crumpled in a rear seat. I lifted my head suddenly, fighting an overwhelming, draining feeling. I screamed incoherently and finally shed a tear, but it wasn't the nurse. The kindly old bus driver shook me again. You alright, kid? You feel like you're half dead. I shook my head. No, no, I, I need to go home. He glanced around at the empty bus, then back at me. 
You know where it is? I held out my phone, which I'd used to map the route the day before. Yeah, just hold on, he said. I'm not supposed to do this, but I'll drop you off at home before I clock out for the night. I kept crying, desperate to go home. I can't imagine what my parents must have thought, seeing a commercial bus pull up directly to their house, but that saint of a man must have knocked on their door and explained things. I awoke in my childhood bed some unknown number of days later, finally able to think again. Weakly, I climbed out of bed and made my shaky way downstairs, where my worried mother immediately rose from the kitchen table and hugged me. My father was close behind, asking me what the hell had happened to me. All I could explain was that the landlord had been taking my blood. That was enough to make my parents horrified and defensive. They took me to the emergency room where I was checked out to ensure I wasn't literally dying. Then they sent me home, and I was put back into my bed with strict orders to rest, drink, and eat very carefully for several weeks. I was almost starting to feel better, but then... Durham found me. I was sitting at the kitchen table one morning when my father entered with a letter in hand. He looked at my mother with concern. We're being sued? Sued? She asked, looking to me. That sense of violation had returned. It was him. Is it Durham? My father nodded. We have to go to court. For what? I demanded. He seemed perturbed as he read further. He's suing you for the remaining rent due on your lease. He's suing for your blood. It was true. I grabbed the papers and read them with a profound sense of horror. Landlord-tenant disputes did happen, certainly, but did the court have any idea what they were entertaining? My parents hired the best lawyer we could afford, and we did have some strategy sessions, but we hadn't figured out a solid plan by the time the hearing date rolled around. Our lawyer had never dealt with anything like this, and he kept saying he wasn't sure whether he was being pranked. After hours of sitting around and waiting, we were finally led into the courtroom, and I stood nervously across the chamber for Mr. Durham. He looked sturdier than I remembered, and some of his white hair had shifted back to a natural black. He gazed back at me above his mask, his expression impassive. I couldn't match his gaze. I knew if I said the word vampire, my case would implode, so I decided to keep my mouth shut. The judge entered, and I waited, a heart pounding, as he took his sweet time sitting and reading the relevant papers on his high desk. Could Durham hear my pulse racing in my ears? For some reason, I believed he could. I felt like a prey animal standing stock still near a predator. Finally, the judge looked over at me. You're the tenant? My lawyer elbowed me in. I said, yes, your honor. Did you sign these? He held out some forms. My lawyer went forward, took them, and brought them back to me. I scanned over photocopies of the paperwork the nurse had given me at my first blood donation. I hadn't really paid attention to them, assuming they were basic medical information forms, but I could see now that they were loan conversion papers to sign up for payment through blood instead of money. My expression fell. I mean, yes, I did, but I didn't know what I was signing. That's no excuse, the judge responded. This is unconventional, but you did sign it, he laughed. (laughs) I'd give an arm and a leg to go without a rent payment. You should consider yourself lucky. I looked at my lawyer, who shrugged. I saw him glance past me at Durham and nod a moment later. Horrified, it occurred to me that our top lawyer had been particularly useless at helping us, and that might have been for a reason. Taking a step away from him, I said, I won't live in that man's apartment. That's up to you, the judge told me, shaking his head. But you still owe the rest of the year-long lease you signed. I see Mr. Durham here has been feeding you out of his own pocket. Seems to me like you're a charity case that's trying to pull one over on this fine, upstanding citizen. 
I'm considering ordering a summary payment in full right now. I looked at my parents behind me who seemed confused while my lawyer remained silent. Putting two and two together, I protested. A full year of blood donations given all at once would drain me dry. It would literally kill me. The judge hesitated. Huh, right. I didn't think about that. Such a strange case. He took another look at his papers. Alright, what I'll do is make the full payment due immediately as a debt, but you can pay in installments with interest. Interest? I shot back, raising my voice. How can I pay interest on giving blood? I can only donate so much at a time, and then I have to wait. This will make me owe him indefinitely. That's for you and Mr. Durham to work out, I suppose. If you don't pay, I'll have you imprisoned, and then they'll just take it from you there. The judge sighed and raised an eyebrow. <sighs> you kids, I swear. You know what you signed up for. Now it's your responsibility to pay what you owe. Raising my voice even louder, I lost my composure and shouted, Is this a fucking joke? This man is a goddamn vampire! Now listen here. Insults do not belong in this courtroom. I'm not insulting him! I screamed, getting desperate. I'm saying he's an actual in-the-flesh vampire. Why the hell do you think he wants me to pay him blood? The judge balked. It felt like I was getting to him, and then I saw him glance over at Durham and Askins. Mr. Durham nodded slightly. Oh. It was like that. The lawyer. The judge. This was all a sham. Mr. Durham owned over 500 properties in this town, and who knew what else? I'd walked into a death trap. I darted to the back, speaking to my parents. Mom, Dad, we gotta get out of here. We gotta move away. He's gonna drain me for the rest of my life. My dad seemed uncomfortable. I could tell he just saw this as a normal courtroom. He thought the system was functioning and that something must be wrong with us, not them. I don't know. You did know what you were signing up for. It's up to every individual's personal responsibility to pay for what they owe. That's what I was taught, and it worked out for your mother and me. I pleaded with my mother. She winced, sadly, but said, Listen to your father. He knows best, and I'm sure everything will turn out alright so long as you make your payments. I looked at some of the other watchers in the room who were quietly awaiting their turn on the stands, but they had their own problems. They avoided eye contact with me. Fine. Forget my dignity. Going up to Mr. Durham, I told him, Look, I'll give you my blood. I'll give it to you regularly for the rest of my life. Just let me do it at a pace that doesn't leave me barely alive. His eyes were ice cold above his mask. Why should I? He was actually asking me. He wasn't being rhetorical. Surging with energy, I let it all flow forth. I just want to live. I don't have big dreams. I won't ask for much. I just want to be a person. I want to have friends. I want to watch television. I want to go on walks. I want time. Tears ran down my face as I thought about the fog. I briefly escaped. I just want time. I just want to be a person. Can't I just be a person? Considering my words, Durham's cold eyes jumped to the judge. I followed his gaze. The judge's eyes were misty, but he was far more scared than he was compassionate. At the other stand, my lawyer had his gaze averted. His knuckles were white on the handle of his briefcase. They both knew exactly what they were doing. I looked back up at Durham. He decided simply, No. My heart sank like a rock. What? Why not? He almost seemed surprised that I didn't know already. <sighs> because I don't care. The judge said something by way of dismissal of conversation, and I found myself being let out by my parents in a daze. Durham had come to me 
in the guise of a kind old man pretending to have my best interests at heart, but behind that act was an inhuman monster. He was going to drain every last drop of vitality from me and leave me a husk, and he didn't care one single bit. It was only on my stunned car ride home that I started receiving messages from the friends that I'd recently left behind. They all had heard about my case by word of mouth. Apparently I'd set a precedent, and now they were all excited to convert their leases to paying in blood instead of money, too. It was the only way to get ahead, they said. Save enough money on rent, and maybe, just maybe, they could buy a house of their own and never have to pay rent again. It was the only way to beat the system. I lifted my head slowly, no longer fighting the overwhelming, draining feeling. When I fell into the pit, it seemed forever before I hit the bottom. The earth there was muddy and soft on the surface, but an inch down, the hard clay wasn't so forgiving. I pitched forward as I'd fallen, making my right knee the first thing to hit and flare with pain. I rolled over onto my back and clutched it instinctively, even as I realized that my left wrist and shoulder were aching and my right wrist was worse. Sprained, at least, and maybe broken. My breath had been knocked out of me, only coming back in short, painful gasps as I looked around. I was down in a hole. No, not just a hole. It was a pit. And intentionally dug a pit that had something laid over it. I remembered my foot hitting it as I ran, giving way before I could step back. Eyes watering, I looked up at the circle of daylight above me, a small patch of blue sky almost completely obscured by the canopy of green. The forest was dense here. This is what I loved about it since I'd started hiking this area last fall. That feeling of natural beauty and solitude that was more serene than lonely, making me feel more a part of something than apart from everything. But then... I'd heard something, hadn't I? Something walking in the woods nearby, still out of sight, but growing closer. My first thought had been a deer, but the longer it went on, it didn't sound right. I'd been with my father hunting enough growing up to know the soft, tentative rustling noises deer tend to make unless running scared, and I'd heard no gunshots in the hour I'd been there. This sound was louder. Less graceful, more constant, as though something was noisily barreling through the trees and brush, maybe at quite a distance. I had the panicked thought of a bear, but I brushed it from my mind. Possible, sure, but really unlikely. Who knew? Maybe it was a running deer, or one of a dozen other animals that could make tons of noise in an empty forest when they had a mind to. Or maybe I wasn't the only hiker out here. I'd never been sure who even owned this property, just that it was part of a thousand-acre tract of woodland that backed up to a nearby state park. In the six months I'd been coming out, I'd never seen a sign of hunters, hikers, or anything else. But that didn't make it... I caught a glimpse of a moving shadow off to my right. What was that? Was it a person? Slowing down, I watched the area where I thought I'd seen motion. A moment later, the figure passed from behind a tree, and I stifled a scream. It was a person. But not a hiker or a hunter. They were wearing a long poncho or cloak, hooded and black, and trailing behind them as they picked up speed again. That was strange enough. There hadn't been any rain all day, and it was unseasonably warm. But then I saw their face. Or where their face would have been. It was hard to say at a distance while they ran, but I thought they were wearing a dark mask. Maybe a gas mask. 
heart pounding, I crouched down where I was. They were running closer, but at an off angle that would probably see them intersect my trail half a mile back. It could be that they hadn't seen me at all, and whoever it was, whatever they were doing, I was keen to keep it that way. Watching from between the branches of a bush, I caught glimpses of the figure as it ran forward with a lurching, wavering pace made all the more unnerving by the unbroken dark silhouette of the coverings it wore. I couldn't even make out arms, and the only bare scent of legs between the length of the poncho and the obstacles between us, just a billowing black shape plunging through the woods like a scepter chasing some unseen prey. Unless that unseen prey was me. I was assuming it hadn't seen me, but how did I know that? Did I really want to wait for it to get closer in the hopes it would pass on by, or was I better off easing on down the path while it was far enough away to likely miss any subtle movement at a distance? Stomach in knots, I chose the latter, easing forward in a crouch. Up ahead, maybe a hundred yards or more, there was a thick knot of fir trees. If I could get past them, put their bulk between us, I'd have a better chance of moving forward without them ever seeing me. I moved another few feet and then paused to check the position of the specter. Was it still flailing along on the same trajectory or had it chosen another path? Oh God. It had stopped. It was looking right at me. Suddenly it started running again, its jerking gait faster and more desperate as it came directly toward me. I thought I could almost hear excited groans from behind the mask, and I heard myself let out a moan as I stood up and began to run. I'm in good shape, but I'd already been hiking for two hours, and this was a part of the forest I'd never seen before. My need for speed had to be balanced with care that I didn't trip on a route or lose my sense of direction. Glancing back again, I saw that the dark figure had made it to my path and was gaining on me. Giving a panicked grunt, I pushed myself harder to widen the gap between us. When I hit the stand of firs, I veered to the right, hoping the change in direction would throw it off. The woods were denser and darker in that direction, and it would only take a few yards for me to be hard to spot at a distance. When I looked back, I saw no sign of the other, but that meant little on its own as the trees obscured my vision too. I needed to rely on sound more now while making less noise myself. It was hard to make myself slow down, but I eased to a brisk trot and then a softer, more gentle walk. The way forward was shadowy except for occasional patches of sunlight, but I thought I still had a rough idea of which way I was headed. For now, my main concern was any signs of being pursued glimpses of flailing darkness or the crashing thud of the specter running close behind. I did hear some noises, but at first they didn't seem to be getting closer, and as I moved on, I could tell they were growing more faint. Turning back to look again, I saw no sign of movement behind me. Good. I was probably four miles from the edge of the state park and another two from my car. If I picked up my pace, I could get there in an hour. My steps crunched louder as I began to jog forward, but I took care to be as quiet as possible, and the extra speed seemed worth the slight increase in noise. Probably five minutes passed before I could hear a loud crack from somewhere behind me. Likely just a branch falling, but I still picked up my pace, my pulse quickening from more than the exertion. That was when my foot hit the ground that wasn't ground, and I found myself tumbling through the dark. Reaching the wall of the pit, I dug my fingers into the dirt there as I tried to stand. I could manage, but putting any weight on my right leg sent a shock of pain up my spine that took my breath away. Not that it mattered. The walls were made of that same hard clay and ran up 15 feet all around, and I pictured the pit as being an oval from above. Glancing around, my gaze caught on something near where I'd landed. A brown tarp lay nearby amid a clutter of branches and leaves. That had been what had covered the hole. This wasn't just a random pit. It was a trap. Who would do this? And 
Why? Was it intended for something in particular? It had to be, right? Otherwise, what was the point of digging a trap in the middle of nowhere? What were the odds a random person would fall into it? Maybe it wasn't even for people, though. People dug pits to trap animals, didn't they? Even big things that could climb, like tigers. But there were no tigers out here. Coyotes and deers, maybe a bobcat, just normal wood critters and me and... A shadow fell over me as I looked up with a gasp. A hooded specter stood at the edge of the pit looking down at me. It was a gas mask after all, and behind it I could hear frenzied squeals. It shuffled excitedly for a moment and then hurled itself forward into the pit, landing on its side with a thump just a few feet away. I was screaming then, but as I watched the thing writhe and squirm in the mud, I felt a growing sense of confusion as well. Why would it just throw itself down here with me? The fall had looked like it hurt, and I still saw no signs of its arms from underneath the muddy black poncho it was wearing. As it was, it was just crawling its way to the far wall where it slowly sat itself up with a labored grunt. Still, I couldn't trust anything here. Wincing at my wrist, I dug into my pocket for my phone as I kept my eyes on the lump of shadow against the far wall. Glancing down, I felt my stomach lurch. The screen was broken and punching the power button did nothing at all. I looked back over at the specter. It wasn't moving. It was just watching me and... Was it crying? heart in my throat, I edged forward. Hello? What is this? What the fuck is going on? Just more sobbing. The hood swaying gently as it shook its head. I was terrified of touching it, but I was out of other options. Maybe they were hurt enough not to fight me, and if they had a phone or something, I could at least try to call for help. I held my dead phone in my throbbing right hand as I reached out to pull up the mask. It was a girl, a crying girl of maybe twenty, eyes red and wild as she looked at me pleadingly, her nostrils flaring as she sucked in panicked breaths. She had no other options either. Her mouth had been glued shut. I sucked in a breath. <laughs> what the f- I noticed a seam down the front of the poncho secured by clasp buttons down to the waist. Hand shaking, I tugged at the buttons until the top few came free. The girl's arms had been tied behind her under the poncho, and judging from the odd angle of the left one, it seemed badly broken either from the fall or from something before. A large dog collar, one of those shock collars with electrodes, was tight against her neck, and taped across her chest was a green note written in black ink. There is only one parachute. Behind me, I heard the sound of an approaching motor and felt a thrill of hope as I looked up toward the opening. Maybe it was a park ranger, or even a hunter that had hurt us. Either way, I wasn't going to risk them riding by without stopping, so I started to scream and yell at the top of my lungs as I stared into the light. The engine noise grew closer and closer as my voice began to grow hoarse and I had a moment of relief as I heard the engine shut off just above the pit. Hello? We're trapped down here. Please help us. There was no response and I was about to yell again when I saw a large white hose creep over the edge of the hole. Maybe they were going to use the hose as a rope to get us out? but then the hose stopped, and a clear liquid began trickling and then pouring from it, splashing onto the ground as it came faster and faster. The smell from it was in my nostrils almost immediately, and as a pool began to form and it splashed further and further, a drop hit my shoe and began to sizzle. Oh, God. It was acid. Someone was pouring fucking acid down here. My shoe was still hissing as another drop hit my pants leg, eating through my jeans to touch liquid fire to my calf. 
Screaming, I pulled my pants leg up, only to get another drop on my arm. I let out a screech of pain as the skin there began blistering immediately. I could hardly think, not just because of the burning and the terror, the fumes were building as the pool widened, and I could feel my lungs tightening as I sucked in the chemicals with each gasping breath. Please, please don't do this. There was no answer, and the stream from the hose grew stronger. It would reach us within a couple of minutes. The girl was squealing again behind me, but for the moment my attention was at a new motion at the top of the hole. A small metal ladder of steel cords and bar rungs had been rolled over the edge next to the hose. As I watched in dismay, the hose was lifted and sat atop the ladder, the acid splashing the rungs as it poured out to the pit. Turning back to the girl, I heard the engine start again and drive away. There was no one coming to help us. We were going to die down here, horribly and painfully, with the only way out, just another version of that same burning death. I looked down at the green note again and swallowed. There was only one parachute. Meeting her eyes, I began to cry myself. I reached forward slowly to retrieve the gas mask from where it lay at the poncho's hood, feeling my throat burn as I whispered to her, I'm so sorry. I'd like to say I was gentle as I took off the poncho, but I was scared and there was no time and she had figured out enough to try and resist. I didn't mean to hurt her, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't know I was grabbing her broken arm too hard when she started to squirm. The pool was to us by the time I buttoned up the poncho. Running around the edge, I made sure to look down before reaching the hungry stream coming from the hose. I half expected the poncho not to matter, a last cruel trick from whoever was behind all this. But no. It seemed to be holding, and while I could hear the bottom of my shoes popping and feel needle-sharp pricks of pain as acid splashed onto the uncovered part of my legs, the poncho seemed to resist it well enough. My body protested as I gripped the first rung through the skin of my covering, but my desperate fear and adrenaline were louder. I made it to the top quickly, stripping off the poncho and mask as I looked around, followed by my shoes and jeans as they continued to burn. There was no one else up there, and when I looked back down in the pit, the girl had stopped moving. Maybe the fumes had finally gotten to her. Maybe she wouldn't wake up again in the end. It was dark by the time I made it back to the park slots and used the emergency call phone. Twenty minutes later, I was in an ambulance, and two hours after that, the amused detective was asking me questions as I fought off the haze of pain meds as best I could. I told him what I knew, which was little. They seemed skeptical, but they couldn't deny my injuries, and they promised to check everything out. That was two months ago. When I call, they say they canvassed the woods, but given the acreage and the vagueness of my directions, they hadn't had any luck finding any tiger pits filled with acid. And then yesterday, another detective assigned to the case called me, and I got her to admit that they found over two dozen filled-in holes in the general vicinity. No signs of bodies or acid, just deep holes that had been recently filled in. It was then she asked the question I've been dreading since I ran away from the tiger pit in the dark. Why didn't you stop the acid? What? Well, you said you saw no one when you got to the top, right? Yeah. And you claimed there was a trailer up there with a giant plastic tank on it. This is what held the acid that was running through the hose into the hole, right? Uh... Yeah, right. So why didn't you stop the acid once you were up there? Mike could have saved that girl. You said it was just barely to her at that point. I... There was no shutoff valve. I, I, I looked and there was no shutoff valve. A pause and then... Okay, why not just move the hose? Even if you couldn't stop the acid, you could have kept it from pouring down on that girl, right? I swallowed. Uh, 
I guess. I uh, I was in shock, okay? I, I was in a lot of pain. Her voice was harder now. No doubt. I saw pictures from you at the hospital. You were fucked up. But not so fucked up you couldn't travel miles to a phone in the dark. Not so fucked up that you couldn't move a hose a couple of feet. If what you're telling us is the truth. I was crying now. It is the truth. All of it, but... I was scared, alright? What if they were still watching? They'd said one parachute. Only one of us can leave. What if I made them mad and they came back? Came back for me. I could hear the disgust in her voice. I see. Well, my partner doesn't believe you too much, if I'm being honest. The land is actually state land, technically. Someone died without any kin some years ago, and no one has tried to buy it since. No real reason to think some nut has been sneaking out there and booby-trapping the place, either. We've had dogs and rangers out there with us twice, but aside from the loose dirt and spots, with the corpse dogs have checked without hitting, by the way, there's nothing to support your story other than your word and a few chemical burns. Trembling, I wasn't sure what to say. Still, I like to think I have good instinct, better than his anyway. And I think I believe you. It would be better for both of us if it wasn't true. What, what do you mean? Well, just think about it. What are the odds that you would be in some isolated woods where some deranged killer was tormenting that poor girl? Based on what you described, and assuming for the moment that the holes we found were related, it sounds like this killer had released this girl, bound and unable to speak, and this mask and poncho get up to, what, run around in the woods for a while? Why? And what was stopping her from running off like you did? I pushed a shaky breath. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the collar? Maybe it shocked her if she left a certain range, kept her in an area, and so she fell in a pit? Hmm, maybe. But then the pit wasn't just meant for her, was it? What? Well, you said that there was a note on her. Only one can leave or something like that, right? There's only one parachute. Right, yeah, right. So that message was intended for someone that found that girl and opened the poncho, right? I guess. But how would they know that there'd be another person? I felt myself getting irritated, my shame and anger and fear all welling back up like they'd been in the days after I escaped the trap. How the fuck should I know? Well, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but what if it wasn't random luck that you were the one that fell into that pit? What do you mean? What if this wasn't about the girl in the poncho? It was all about you. Maybe they'd been following you, watching you, studying your habits, planning a way of getting you where they wanted. That doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? Why would they tie up a girl, slap a gas mask and a poncho on her, and then toss her down into a pit, only to then fill it with acid? Or do you think she jumped in herself? I... No. Someone shoved her in, probably. Well, if we're going to believe all that from you, why do we need to assume they have any rational reason for any of this at all? Maybe there's just some psycho sadist that wants to hurt people. I could feel myself growing clammy with sweat as I looked out the window at the street below. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I was going to try and end the call when she was talking again. And so maybe the sadist isn't really after you. Maybe they've been slowly influencing your life in small ways for months, waiting to see if you'd notice. If you'd see the dark thread that had entered the fabric of your life. If you'd finally see them. Detective, I, I, I need to be going. Thank you for the... And maybe the collar was an offense. It was a bit in the mouth, steering a little pony this way and that when needed. Or maybe, just maybe, it wasn't even the girl under the poncho that was chasing you the entire time. Maybe it was the monsters that put you down in the pit and helped you burn that poor girl while she tried to scream. I... This is... I'm sorry, but what did you say your name was again? I'm going to have to speak to your supervisor. 
I said my name was Brown or Browning or Blake. I don't remember. Who are you? It doesn't really matter who I am, does it? You're asking the wrong question. I... What's the right question? Where am I? I... You crazy fuck. I'm calling the cops. If you do, they won't find you when they get here. What? What do you want? She gave a light laugh. Nothing much? (laughs) Just answer one more question. I... Okay. What? Do you see me now? <laughs>